Hello, this is Tech Sergeant Marshall. Back, welcome back to Ask a Recruiter. So today we're going to talk about the second half, which is you know once you leave our office, we actually give you to the student flight coordinators, um, and we have an excellent person, and she is one of the coordinators that I adore. I hated when she actually left for a little while because it then became chaotic, and then she came back and you know set everything right, but then she's leaving again. So before she actually leaves the the DC Air National Guard. Now remember how I said this, DC Air National Guard. I want you all to know that what exactly it takes to get somebody actually in the unit, because this is the second process. So I need you guys to understand that once the recruiter is done with you, we don't help you through these next stages. That's what the student flight coordinator does. Um, and each section, each unit is definitely different. Um, there is a overall guidance, but um, because she is the expert of what she does, and she does a phenomenal job each time we get you know hundreds of you all in. I wanted to get her insight um, before she left. So our guest today is uh, Tech Sergeant Smith, um, and she's from the 113th FSS. And for those of you who don't know what FSS is, it's a force support squadron here at the DC Guard. Welcome, ma'am. How are you? Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I am wonderful. You ready? So where exactly, if you don't mind, where are you going? I'm going to work for the Joint Force Headquarters, um, and we work with the 113th DC Air National Guard as well, so I'll still be relatively close, but not doing exactly the same things that I do now. Are you excited? Very excited, actually. <laughs> You're beaming, actually. Thank you. So, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, like how long you've been in, and you know, especially in student flight? Well, I've been in for 17 years. Um, this, as far as working with student flight, I've coordinated the student flight program for the last five years. I revamped it from where it was when I first got here in 2012 to the uh, DC Guard. And what I've been told, it's been quite a success. I'm proud mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. So pretty much that's what I've done. I've also worked at uh, the Pentagon on some of the regulations that dictate the newer recessions uh, coming in, which I'm proud of that too, because that directly impacts the student flight, which is why I was happy to do that as well. So now the new venture. The new venture. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's where I'll be now. And like I said, congratulations Thank and everything. You. So we're going to get some nuggets for you before we leave, mostly because um, the people that come in as well as for recruiters, because honestly and truly, sometimes once we've enlisted them, we have no idea where where they go they just kind of go into the abyss until we get a phone call understandable <laughs> so can you explain to me what a student flight program is especially for the for the unit here well for the 113th um the 113th dc air national guards program um their program basically it was established um as a foundation for the non-prior service personnel um to build on military life and what is expected to give them the tools basically for success um, for military training okay okay and what is the process so i know that like i said i was saying in my other podcast you know once we've gotten you in and you swear in and then we kind of like hand you this lovely manila folder and say we're done um so what is the process from there once they're um uh, they're, they've left the recruiter and they've gone to you when I sit down with the newer recruits, uh, the non-prior service members, um, I try to establish their complete financial package so that way they don't have problems with pay or if they have any questions, we answer all that stuff then. Um, so that way when we get to drill, we don't have to bog down the time with questions as far as finances go and, and that kind of thing. I also do their um, service life insurance as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we can get that out of the way because that's a vital part of them going to basic training. Uh, that has to be done first. And I do their emergency data information. And we also do their security clearance, which is humongous. Mm -hmm. uh, it is vital that that is done. I give them a three-day period um, to get it done online uh, in a, the equip system. And as they're sitting there talking to me and we're going through all of the things that we do during drill and that kind of thing, I will put that information into the system. I will schedule their fingerprint appointment and that kind of thing to get the ball rolling. Is there any paperwork that they should be able to bring to you to make sure that the Eclipse is done? I know that um, for us, we give them the 
SF-86 before they leave, so that actually helps out as far as the expedition. But what about for the SGLI or the um, the 93 or the finance paperwork? Is there any items that they should bring with them to make that process faster? Yes. Uh, they should bring their routing number, their accounting number. That's for the financial paperwork so that we can route their pay to the right account. That makes sense. Um, and then they should also decide prior to coming uh, who would they like to receive whatever funds there might be for their life insurance uh, whether it be their mother their brother their cousin whomever we need those names addresses and phone numbers so that we send the money to the appropriate individuals okay um, so as recruiters, um, we get a lot of questions that say like, hey, you know, once we give them the sheet of paper, because it's the order that says, hey, this is what your schedule is going to be like the whole year, be here between the hours of 7.30 and 4. But of course, because they're not in basic training and tech school already, their biggest question is, well, what do I do during drill? So now that you're the expert, what do they do during drill? <laughs> <laughs> well, during drill, um, prior to drill, either the Thursday before the drill um, or the Friday, before the drill, a mass email is sent out that tells them exactly where to meet, um, the time frame in which they will meet, and they all meet as a group. Uh, it will also tell them what to wear during drill. And currently, they wear a white t-shirt and jeans, um, but when they first show up, I expect them to have on fitness uh, clothing. And that's because the first thing that we always do is fitness every single drill. Why is fitness important? Fitness is important because uh, not only is the academic part a requirement for basic training, but the physical is as well. If you don't pass the physical, then you don't pass basic training. So that's to help them. Um, is there anything they should be aware of as far as like, you know, because uh, we as recruiters, we just know, hey, this is your height, this is your weight. Oh, you make the weight requirements for MEPS, great. But um, is there something in particular they should be able to look to see if there's a, you know, how fast they have to run or something like that, or do they get that later on when they get down there? Well, the basic training standards are slightly different from the established um, standards that we have, those of us who've already been in the uh, prior service ones. So... I would say that you can look on the DC Air National Guard's website and that is on there. Um, that's a good way to gauge whether or not you're within those time frames or as far as push-ups go or sit-ups go. You can look online and see that or the app. You can download the app as well and I encourage you all to download the app um, to see what those standards are. But basic trainings is a little bit different than the prior service ones. so. Good to know. So another question that we get as recruiters that we don't have an answer for is uh, school dates. You know, we get them in, we understand, hey, uh, this is the job that you qualify for based off our standards, but then they start freaking out because when am I going to school, when am I going to school? And obviously we tell them that's not something that's our necessarily our program, but um, can you give us some insight as to what uh, goes into actually getting them to school? So making sure that their security clearance is done the fingerprints are done that's part of the security clearance um, and then we are at the mercy of OPM who does the inv investigations but once they open that investigation um, I'm able to go in and to actually request from education and training a basic training date along with the tech school date and hopefully those two marry up sometimes they do not and the person will have to come back after basic training but it's never an extended amount of time so that's definitely something that I encourage that's why they have the three-day turnaround time for the security clearance mm -hmm. because it's a key point in trying to get them the school dates that they are asking for gotcha so basically if you hear that listeners if you don't have your shit together which is your security clearance paperwork and it's not filled out and you don't fill it out within three days that's one two three don't come to your recruiter boohooing and crying saying I can't do this that and a third go back to your security man or your not security manager go back to your student flight coordinator and say hey how do I get back in there because everything's dependent on the fact that you do your part so that we can all do our part to get you what you want which is a school day okay because you know life is always on hold until you actually leave and come back like remember how we talked about your bonus pay we also talked about um, 
any other thing that we get like tuition assistance and GI bills all dependent on you coming back from tech school and we can't even get you a date if you haven't even done your security clearance so keep that in mind when you start asking questions as to how long things are taking the question is do are you the hold up are you the reason why we can't you can't move forward so I just want you to understand that you know that it's not always on the individuals that you're pointing your finger at it's, the, it's always a question of how can you be proactive versus reactive when things don't go your way so just keep that in mind so we got a couple more questions so stick with us um, so my other question is um, a lot of people can't seem to get on base obviously because they don't have you know we'll say I did my security clearance um, but they want this thing called an ID because now they want to feel like, you know, quote unquote official. So how long does it take them to get their ID? So once the person is uh, gained into the system and the system in which I'm referring to is our DEER system and into the actual 113th DC Air National Guard system, uh, roughly the turnaround time for that is about two weeks. So if they enlist two days before drill, they will not have an ID card. And we know that. So what I always tell them in the email as well, the one that goes out prior to drill, is that you need to bring a copy of your contract that your recruiter gives you. Um, and that establishes that, yes, I'm legit. I'm supposed to be here. And security forces, those individuals that stand at the gate, they will let you through as long as you have your contract, a valid ID, which normally I tell people their driver's license uh, will suffice. You need your insurance information, so your insurance card is important as well. And those things will help you to access the base uh, without any hesitation, they'll let you on. Is there any place that there's, a, for a DC only, is there a specific place that they should meet? Let's say they forgot their orders or anything like that. Should there be a specific place that they should meet up with you? Or is just kind of like, call me and, or not you but you know because you're the yeah, exactly. <laughs> call, call the specific number call the coordinator don't call me please I'm sorry <laughs> um, but I will say this uh, what I normally do is I have everyone to meet at the visitor center mm -hmm. um, and that's a, a centralized place everyone knows where it is the address is actually on the email that I send as well um, as a point of reference on that Saturday of drill and the reason I do that is in case someone needs to be dropped off and they don't have a vehicle they can ride with another student flight member who is already established within the program they're familiar with what we do um, we're not, I'm not here to go to the gate pick up people literally in my car and drive them back to the 113th um, it's more or less like I'm encouraging the wingman concept I'm encouraging those individuals to network because that's necessary you need that later on in your career after basic training after tech school so you're already establishing quote-unquote friends oh, I love there that you go. I love that concept that way you're not like oh my gosh I can't get on help or, me yeah or I don't know anyone you do you, you know do. someone now on the average just as a side question I know I didn't ask uh, prepare that one for you but on the average how many student flight members do you coordinate are you in charge of? <laughs> That's in, a great question. Quote unquote, in charge, <laughs> you know, of. Well, there are currently um, roughly about 80 students, 80 plus students within Student Flight. Some of those um, individuals you don't see because they're in basic training or tech school. However, um, I'm still responsible for them as well. And those that show up to drill or you know, the unit training assemblies, they are roughly at this point about 40. So about forty people every drill session. Okay. Now I got one of the I got another some more questions. One other thing I have found out is let's say somebody calls and say, Hey, you know what? I just can't make it to drill because of car broke down, grandmother passed away, whatever catastrophic thing happened and they just can't make it to drill. My work schedule is still having me go to work and they haven't kind of worked that out. What can they do to make up a drill? We normally don't make up drills for the student flight and that's only because when they go to basic training um, and as you know within the guard you either have a good year or you don't based on the amount of drills that you attend um, with those individuals who are prior service members it's vital for them not to miss drill because they won't have a good year and it won't count towards retirement and that kind of thing however the student flight is unique in the way that once they go to basic training those sessions that they may have missed we do not encourage them to miss any drills at all because the information that's given during drill is vital for them prior to basic training. However, if something does occur like a car accident, a passing of um, 
you know, like your grandmother or a parent or whomever, um, someone close to you, we we do allow an exception to that policy. So they don't make up the drill because of basic training. Basic training will fulfill the the full spectrum of a good year. Okay. Speaking of uh, tech school and basic training, so a lot of people start freaking out because obviously they, whatever job they have, they're like, hey, I get paid a certain amount. And then when you go to basic training, we're like, yep, all that coordination, especially during basic training, you no longer have a cell phone, you no longer have computer access, you're you're on this little remote island. Um, and a lot of people freak out because we also tell them that they get E3 pay if they're lucky. And so they go from maybe, you know, a check of 5000 to, you know, $3,000 or whatever the case is. So my question is, is um, what pay, you know, how does the pay actually work for them when they leave? So in a lot of positions, not all, um, you have military leave. Uh, so you coordinate that through the HR department of your civilian position wherever you work there, you make sure that you let them know that you're going on to a military tour. Um, they may ask for like a copy of your orders or a memo from us. That's fine. We'd be happy to provide that for them. Um, so that's how you go and leave from your civilian job. Government positions, there is military leave that you take. So you still can get paid in some of those positions, not all, but some. Um, and as far as what the entitlements are, um, when you do leave, you're entitled to what we call BAH, which is which is your base housing allowance. And if you have a lease that you're already in, or you have a mortgage that you pay, then you bring in a copy of whatever that lease amount is, or whatever your mortgage is, and you give that to finance. Also, if you have dependents, uh, we ask that you set up arrangements for your dependents prior to you leaving. I, when I send out um, the request for the school dates, I also send out an email to those individuals that I've requested school dates for, and that is an indication. It should be a red flag to get all of your financial items in order. Any dependent information, like if you have a child and you need someone to keep your child for two months or three months while you're in basic training, you should be coordinating that as soon as you receive that email. And if you have questions, you need to ask those types of questions during the drill because those are vital things that need to be taken care of prior to you leaving. That makes sense. Um, I do want to caveat and let you all know that um, for single parents that are out there, whether they're single moms or single dads, um, let your recruiter, your recruiter is going to ask the question. It's called a waiver. Um, it's called a 357, and you have to fill that out, letting you know that you are eligible. Um, on the active duty side, if you are a single parent, unfortunately, you would have to give up all full custody of your child, full physically, physically, and um, you know, uh, legal custody, because you cannot take your child with you um, necessarily. But on the guard side, because we only work one week in a month, two weeks out of the year, and we're designated to a certain area, whether it's a territory or a state. Um, you come back home so you can have you're giving up te temporary legal and physical guardianship of your child so um, we also help you as far as filling that information out and that is something that you have to have before you can actually enlist so that would be some of the paperwork that she would use to help you guys out as far as you know who is who's gonna be taking care of your kid while you're gone and um, you know especially for unfortunate people who they get a divorce, you know, their spouse, maybe your ex-spouse may be taking care of the child. So that is another thing to make sure that you bring to the attention. And I want you all to know out there that, yes, the guard does accept you if you are a single parent. So don't think of this as a non-option just because life happens at you fast and it's not an option for you. Um, so le let me say I'd, out of the four years I have been a recruiter, I have got a massive amount. I seem to be the guru. Um, for non-U.S. citizens, and um, but I want to see it from your perspective. What are some of the things? What is the process if those are not, you know, U.S. citizens that are trying to actually come into the military? Well, active duty has a process when you go to basic training uh, to help you become a U.S. citizen. So what we do, uh, or what I do in the student flight program is, I have you fill out the nationalization pro um, nationalization paperwork. Excuse me. Um, prior to leaving and I will give that to education and training um, to go in your folder when you go to base for when you go to basic training um, and when you get there 
you're identified as someone who needs to go through that program as well. It's a faster way to become a citizen. Um, and the process is, is already been streamlined through active duty. And so what from what I've heard, it's all been good things. So the process of right now that they have in place on active duty is seamless. It's a very, very good program. So as long as you fill out the paperwork prior to leaving, um, and as long as you identify yourself as someone who is not a U.S. citizen to the student flight coordinator, they can get you the proper paperwork that needs to be in your file prior to you leaving so that it is known when you get there that you need to go through that process. Okay. So you have some very huge, you know, shoes to fill since, you know, you've been the, 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 the matriarch, we'll say, of the program since you've uh, been here. And um, is so whoever is taking over or for the people that are coming after you, the enlistees that are the legacies that are coming in, yes. is there any helpful tips um, that you would give or any other recruiter that you would give them any tips about the position that you're leaving? Um, for the recruiters, um, my tip and always has been <laughs> is to always redirect the non-prior individual to the student student flight coordinator and I say that because there are things that they absolutely need that others don't have a clue not even remotely <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> um, they need they need special attention to certain things and it's everything is not for everyone especially when it comes to the military we know that already um, and when it comes to the student flight program there are there are the future of our 113 Air National Guard so we want to make sure that they get everything that they need so that they can succeed and in order to do that the student flight uh, program coordinator is the person who has the answers so I always ask for the recruiters to redirect them to the student flight program coordinator because of that now you know that since you're no longer going to be the the uh, the the heartbeat, who exactly or what number exactly do you give out so that people from the one thirteenth, not from New York, New Jersey, Ohio, Alaska, but from the D.C. Air National Guard located on Andrews Air Force Base, who exactly do they call? Um, well, they have a student flight coordinator phone number um, that they can call, and that number is area code two four zero. 305-9191 and I noticed that a lot of people like to text now and that's perfectly fine but I do encourage you to limit your phone calls to drill weekend because that's when the phone is monitored it's not monitored throughout the month it's only monitored when we have drill so if you're a part of that student flight I encourage you to utilize that phone to text, to call, or what have you, because that's the phone that the coordinator will have on them, and it will be on during drill. And what's the number again? That number is 240-305-9191. So as I, as we go in closing, I want you all to understand that this is, um, this is an honor for me. I on your last day to uh, <laughs> sit down and pick your brain and be able to say like you know you get to leave your legacy nuggets here um, with the guard uh, with the 113th and with throughout the guard because obviously this will be heard through everybody um, and be able to be helpful and so forth so is there anything else you'd like to leave behind as we voice record you saying goodbye and everything it's just been don't an cry honor. I don't know oh, issues definitely not <laughs> but it's just been an honor honestly um, to to touch people who are those individuals who will be taking the place, my place, obviously, mm -hmm. <laughs> at some point, um, your place, and those that came before us. It's, it's an honor to have touched them and to have helped them get through the process. And there, all of those individuals that I have touched are proud to have been, even though initially they may have felt that they were getting a hard time. <laughs> it helped them in basic training, and that's all that I cared about. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out. Um, uh, what we're going to do is uh, I have somebody else we're going to interview at another podcast that's going to take the next level or the next step of the process. But as you can see, if you're actually listening to this, you know, we've been talking for a little over 20 minutes and this is not an easy process. It's not just, you know, I swore in and 
boom, you're off to school and boom, it's going to be this. Not, it's an actual process. And part of the process is to make sure that you actually do your part to make sure that it, it flows real well. Um, so uh, thank you for taking the time out to talk with me today and to talk to, you know, the future minions out there. Um, so we're going to close and saying thank you and we will talk to you soon. It's been a pleasure. I'll stand.